Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Glad to have you out this evening. I know it's a bit foggy out there, so we appreciate your coming, but at least uh, it's not snowing, for which we are very grateful. I'd like to welcome you to the last of our Great Decisions programs for 2015. This is the one at the New Canaan Library. And we do have just one of the 2015 Great Decisions books remaining. So it's half price tonight, $10. We'll have the new 2016 ones, which uh, have the topics for that year. But these articles are continue to be timely. So even though this is 2015, I think you'll find a lot of interesting articles. So if anybody's interested in purchasing it, purchasing it we will have it at the... Um, at the table. I also want to mention that um, we're appreciative of the New Canaan Library for hosting us here. And also, we are pleased to be sponsored for this program by HSBC Bank USA. It's obviously a bank that's main focus is on international connectivity and offers a lot of services to countries and territories around the world. So obviously, if anyone is interested in um, stopping by HSBC, the bank that is sponsoring it this evening is the one on the Post Road in Darien. So again, we do thank them for their support. And as you know, this program is free and open to the public, but we are a membership organization that relies on dues and contributions to provide between 25 and 30 programs that we put on over the course of the year. And so I'm specifically asking each of you to consider, if you're not already, becoming a member of the World Affairs Forum. We have two series. One is the Ambassador's Roundtable, which is our executive briefing series, and reduced rates are now in effect for the re remainder of the year because we're just about halfway through the program. So if you're interested, again, we have material at the, uh, at the back of the, of the room that you can pick up and see what's, uh, see what's coming up. For the forum series, that's just $20 to join, and the next program there is going to be on January 20th at the Ferguson Library, and the speaker is going to be Tsveta Petrova of the Eurasia Group, and she is going to be talking about the migrant crisis in Eastern Europe, which should be extremely timely. And my final pitch is uh, for our annual appeal. Anyone who is on our email distribution list has already received, I think, two emails uh, asking you to consider making a tax-deductible contribution to the World Affairs Forum as part of your end-of-year giving. So we would appreciate that if you are so moved. And we also have forums, again, back at the table if you'd like to take one. Because we do, we do need financial support beyond our dues, and we appreciate it. Uh, any amount of any amount, and we appreciate all of your coming this evening and contributing to the forum in any way that you feel comfortable doing. So let me now introduce Ken Hecht. Ken, for a number of years now, has been organizing these great decisions programs, and Ken will introduce our speaker this evening. Ken. Thanks, folks, for coming out tonight. The weather is not really in our favor, but we're looking forward to a great talk uh, by Ann Wells. Um, Ann has had uh, a lot of hands-on experience in Tanzania and Africa, and I, you know, we were talking about um, a program that we wanted to do on Africa as part of the Great Decisions um, series, and um, so often we cover the very broad picture, the, the broad geopolitics, the economics, and um, I think that misses what, what, what really is going on on the ground. And Anne is going to be able to do this for us in a way that is uh, very different. I just want to give you a little background about Anne. She was named a local defender by the Robert F. Kennedy Center for Justice and Human Rights. She received her BA in anthropology from Kenyon College and received the Margaret Mead Award and attended the University of California at Berkeley's Graduate School of Jur Journalism and founded the Unite the World with Africa Foundation to promote peace and prosperity for the world's poor through the provision and advancement of health education and, very importantly, microfinance programs. She has more than 20 years of experience working with corporations and for nonprofits. and runs the Unite Tours Service Safari Program, and she has a lovely a collection that she's um, brought together, the Ash Collection, the Global Marketplace um, for African Artistry, and you can go to the website and take a look at that. And um, she co-directs the Unite for Africa Youth Group pro program here in the United States. So without further ado, we're very pleased to welcome Anne. And shall we dim the lights? Yeah, OK, so we'll get the lights dimmed. Thank you. 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 Thank you
you, Ken. Thank you all so much for coming out and for inviting me here tonight. Um, it's such a pleasure. I appreciate your time at this busy holiday season. And they get ready to, as they're dimming the lights. So basically, I'm just going to tell you a story about Tanzania and about specifically my experience in Tanzania and the work that our foundation is doing to uplift lives. Um, OK, we're good. Can you hear me? Is that better? OK, guys, sorry about that. Um, OK, so I'm going to take you back and just give a little overview. If you all are experts on Tanzania, forgive the repetition. Um, but Tanzania is the largest country in East Africa. It's about twice the size of California, uh, borders eight countries in the Indian Ocean. Um, it's home to 130 resident tribes. And my first experience in Tanzania was in 1991. I went over there. We were the first group of American students to go in after it became, opened up from a socialist state. We dug water lines, learned to shoot, and played with snakes. <laughs> um, and I fell in love with the country. And at school, I was at Kenyon College at the time studying anthropology. And um, many of you know Margaret Mead, the great anthropologist who worked in uh, Samoa and Papua New Guinea, and really was one of the first people to assert that you know, violence and war and greed, these are learned behaviors that as such can be unlearned. And she was an inspiration to me. Um, and this quote really is what changed my life. Uh, Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing it ever has. So that gave me hope that maybe some normal, average person like me could make a difference. So years later, that experience um, really was the foundation for what is now Unite the World with Africa Foundation. And again, um, Ken read our mission, so I won't repeat it. But this talk tonight is how we focus on warriors for change. We really are talking about the investment in individuals and their visions. So I'm going to take you a little further. So when people think of Tanzania and East Africa, most people are thinking of safari. And it is uh, the greatest spot for safari on Earth. Um, it has the greatest concentration of wildlife. This is the entrance to the Serengeti National Park. Uh, this is some of the great migration. Each year, over 3 million zebras and undulates go uh, hundreds of miles, thousands of miles through Tanzania and the Maasai Mara in Kenya in search of water and rain. It's an extraordinary sight. The wildebeest will birth as they're running, and within seconds, if not minutes, um, the, the babies will be up and running. But most people think of the Big Five, and everyone who goes to Tanzania wants to see the Big Five on safari. They want to see the rhino, the leopard, the buffalo, Simba, and of course, Tembo the elephant. You guys may have heard of anyone who's watching current events with Tanzania, the slaughter of elephants in southern uh, Tanzania, in, specifically in the Salu National Park, is horrifying. They've lost over 60% of their herds in the last 10 years, and there's an estimate that over 3,000 animals are being killed every day. Um, the reason this is so easy for poachers who are coming in with AK-47s and poison is because these animals mourn their dead. So when one of the herd is killed, the rest of them will come to put their trunks over and to mourn, and so they are a perfect target. It's a terrible, terrible thing that's happening. So anyone who wants to go see these animals, I suggest you talk to me and get over there fast. <laughs> um, but I think of Tanzania, and the way I explain the beauty and the magic of this country is Anne's Big Five. It's a big five that I think is what really gets into people's hearts and their minds and their souls and is what ultimately keeps us coming back. And you start with land. I think everyone in this room knows what it's like to fall in love with a country, to fall in love with a place, and Tanzania is magnificent. It's home to Mount Kilimanjaro, the highest peak in Africa, at over 19,000 feet. This is the view from the top of the Ngorogoro Crater, which is the eighth wonder of the world. It's home to a resident population of 27,000 animals. Here, Oldonia Langai, the Maasai Mountain of God. Um, it's a semi-active volcano. And of course, Lake Manyara, there's many, many lakes. There's the Indian Ocean, the great beaches of Zanzibar, and sunsets that'll knock your socks off. So it's a very easy place to fall in love with, simply because it's so beautiful. 
The next L for me is loads. Everywhere you look in Tanzania, you'll see people carrying, usually it's women and children, tremendous, unimaginable loads on their heads, on their backs, bicycles when they have them. Look at how clever they are. Look at that. Look at that. Motorbikes. Everybody's welcome on the motorbike. And when they have them on their vehicles. So one is always left wondering and amazed at the resourcefulness of these people, how hard they work, how committed and determined and how creative and how diligent and all of those remarkable creative problem solving skills. I always think, and it's part of Unite's work, to see what could happen if that tremendous energy could be channeled into more positive vocations like uh, education or you know, ongoing careers. So part of our work is to alleviate this suffering, a little one. So Tanzania is a country of 50 million people. Over half are age 16 and younger, and 64% are age 24 and younger. Only 5% of the population is over age 60. So it is a young country, and the children are everywhere. Everywhere you look, in the distance, there's a boy by his house, behind trees, running to you by the roadside. Rural families tend to have enormous families. Uh, largely, birth control is virtually unheard of. Um, and in more urban, educated areas, it's still very difficult to get. Um, so also, families do not expect most of their children to live. So they'll have 10, expecting maybe five to make it past age five. These children spend their days taking care of other children. And these is regularly what we see as on the side of the road. Many of these kids, of these families are facing extreme poverty. Over 80% of Tanzanians work as subsistence farmers. And so these children, instead of being in school, are working for their families. They're collecting water during the day, trying looking for clean water. This is really the job of girls. They're working their family shambas. The boy with a, with a machete, he has. They're cooking, preparing food. They're taking care of their livestock, specifically the Maasai tribe, which many of you might be familiar with. The young boys take care of those livestock, and they spend their days out walking these animals around. Really, they get no water. It's remarkable how they are able to do it. They carry their loads. This, actually, Josephine and I were in Tanzania in January, and this girl, we were going down, this is on Kilimanjaro, we are going down the mountain, and she must have lapped us about 15 times, going up and down, getting these grasses for her family cow. And also, as we mentioned, I think these children are having children, so teenage pregnancy is a big, big problem in Tanzania. A lot of times it's because children are married off very young for dowry, or sometimes it's simply because the girls don't understand how it is that they're getting pregnant. Um, there's a big problem with sugar daddies, where they'll be with men to get a cell phone or food or anything else that they need. So these children, as soon as a girl becomes pregnant, she's immediately expelled from school. There are, there, right now, there's groups in Tanzania trying to change that law, um, but her future is over. And oftentimes, she, she has really no idea how this happened or it's not her choice. So here are some young moms. So with these children and the poverty and the malnutrition and the illness that we're facing, which is really rampant, Unite's work is to find and invest in individuals and programs that's gonna make their lives happy and specifically to feed them, to give them proper health care, specifically very much so the schools, and we'll talk more about that, um, so that their dreams can come true and they can be productive members of society. 
um, love, this is a fun one. So Tanzania, and again, anyone who's been to Africa knows that the love is overwhelming. It feels like it comes up through the earth and like through your body and out through your head. I mean, it's everywhere. The people we meet for the first time give us the warmest embraces. There's so much love freely given without any ties, no strings attached. Everyone is just happy, and there's so much laughter. So the young people specifically that travel with us can't imagine how in a place where there's so little and there's so much physical suffering, there can be so much love and so much joy. And leadership. This is really where Unite comes in. So our work, again, we believe that development can be done in a lot of different ways. Our approach is to go to the very, very grassroots level and go village by village and community by community and to find those individuals who have dedicated their entire lives to service and to uplifting the lives of people who are suffering. Usually our focus is women and children, but we won't exclude boys and men. Um, and we tend to focus on health, education, and microfinance. Over the years, we've invested in hundreds of these individuals to reach tens of thousands of indiv further individuals. And I'm just going to highlight a few of them here for you tonight. So this is Sist Sister Crispina Mnate. She is the founder. She's a nun, a Catholic nun. She's the founder of the St. Joseph's Health and Orphanage Center. Crispina explains her story, which is wonderful. I wish you could all hear it from her and not from me, but that God spoke to her in 2000 and told her it was time that she stepped forward to rescue the abandoned babies in Tanzania. What happens is these children, these specific children, are, as infants, put in bags and thrown on the side of the road. And most people leave them there. They don't do anything. Or they're left in garbage heaps. Or they're left in the bush to be eaten by hyena. And so people who find them now know to bring them to Crispina and that she'll raise them. Um, and when we first came to Crispina's orphanage in 2014, actually it was first seen by our medical director, Josephine Bernowski, who's here tonight. This is what it looked like. This is the girls' dorm. And Crispina had done an extraordinary job um, putting this place together and running it in excellence and is you know, super clean and very organized. And the way she would earn money um, is to get up at four in the morning and walk to Arusha town, which is the closest metropolitan center of a couple hours walk away, and go door to door and beg. And Crispina is a nun, and in Tanzania, almost 99% of people believe in witchcraft, very much so. So people are very spooked about saying no to a nun. <laughs> so she gets good prices, and she gets what she wants. But anyway, she has a lot of needs, and we're there now in full to help her. So we started simply by renovating the buildings, fortifying the buildings, repainting, bringing in um, mattresses and beds and bed nets very basic uh, things to uplift the center. The water, it's a part of the country where there's very little water, little groundwater, so we have to catch the rain. So we put in uh, the rainwater harvesting gutters um, and big tanks to catch them. We've put them on all the buildings now. We actually have been very fortunate to get grants from the Carl Greer Foundation. I don't know if any of you are familiar with him, but he's been incredibly kind and has funded this part of the project. Um, and when there is no rain, we truck water in. Um, otherwise, they have none. Uh, we've put in water purification systems and sanitation systems. So when we arrived on site, these were the toilets for a resident population of about 70 people. And then, of course, there's all the students and people coming and going. There were three pit latrines. Um, so we built new ones. And we raised money through our youth group in Darien at the Darien High School. They raised $2,400 dollars to rebuild the toilets. It's amazing how far the dollar will go in this setting. Um, and this is a healthy, sanitized pit latrine with proper ventilation and hand washing stations. Very important. So this is a really exciting development. We brought in solar lamps, and more recently, we just received a second grant from the Carl Greer Foundation to do solar panels. So actually, as of this morning, I heard that those were being installed. We had them on site. We did not have the installer there. And Everything takes a long time in Tanzania, but anyway, they're being installed as we speak, so they will have light. Crispina keeps texting me on WhatsApp, and Miss Ann Wells, we are in the dark. <laughs> we are in the dark, and I'm like, we're working on it. Um, so anyway, and then cooking, of course, is a lot of mouths to feed. So these girls would be walking long distances to catch, you know, to cut down wood to come back to cook over such this type of stove. It was very time consuming, you know, a lot of wood cut, deforestation, not good for the environment, and certainly it puts the girls at risk. 
So we put in industrial stoves, which use less uh, wood and also just has a much more efficient yield. And this is the Heaven School. Uh, when we came in 2014, this was the entire pre and primary school. And Crispina kept telling us she needed a proper primary school. And we kept wondering how on earth we were going to make that happen. We needed to raise $32,000. And it's been amazing what um, the world has done for Unite and so Unite can do for others. We've had a tremendous year and we're, we're, our goals for next year are 10 times bigger. So we were able to, as of this summer, build them a primary school, which takes the children to about age 13. So this is the Heaven School. And when we were there this summer, um, the, all the teammates that were with us and the kids were painting murals on the side to make it a happy place. Uh, so it's a really lovely, lovely place. Um, that's the photo for about three weeks ago. So they've just finished it and it will officially open for business on January 4th. It's inside of one of the classrooms. We also believe in comprehensive education. So Unite funds um, music education programs as well as rec programs. And we are, have a partnership with Discovery Learning Alliance. And they very kindly, um, due to Andy Warren, who's on our board of directors, they've allowed us to use a lot of their educational materials, which is really sort of unheard of in the way that they operate, to bring in extra studies materials for these students. And we've also just started a partnership with Level Up Village to connect Heaven School with a school in America via Skype, and they'll collaborate on science projects. So these children are starting to have access to the world in a much, much bigger way. Um, this is Irene, one of the cutest little orphans, and some of her friends. And so now, and moving forward, they'll all have a proper education. Um, Peter and one of the boys. So I just want to show you, this summer we were very lucky. We got to have a, a documentary team with us from Southern California called the Pamoja Project. Whoops, I'm going to go back. And here's a clip to introduce you to Crispina. There is one day they told me to stand up to introduce myself and the work which I'm doing here. So I went there in front. I greeted them. Then I say, you woman, how many kids do you have in your house? I have only three. I go to another one. You woman, how many do you, the kids do you have? Only one. Listen, do you like me to tell you something? Myself, I am a woman of 47 children. Who, who is a woman like me in this world? <laughs> they laughed. They... <laughs> oh, she's fabulous. Oh, my goodness. So when Crispina says, Ann Wells, we need light, we say, yes, Crispina, we'll get you light. <laughs> Whatever she says, we do. Um, so this is our next warrior for change. This is Nurse Ruth Matthias. Ruth is um, very much independently serving the Hadzabi. The Hadza are the last living hunter-gatherers of East Africa. They live as we do before, did before the advent of agriculture 10,000 years ago. Um, the men hunt. They make, this is from just trees, bow and arrow to hunt what now has become as they're becoming more marginalized on their lands and losing their land to urban sprawl and farmlands. They used to hunt big game, and now they're really surviving on rodents and squirrels, which is part of the crisis that this population is facing. There's only 300 of them left in Tanzania. Um, so here they are hunting. The women collect tubers and berries, and they live in these sort of upside-down bird's nests that can be put together in about a half an hour and easily abandoned. They follow, uh, they used to follow the game, and now they sort of go where there's water or something to eat. Um, they'll also leave their camp if somebody dies. They'll leave the body and move on. Um, so they're hand-built. The children are cared for by anyone. Nobody really connects with a specific mother. They're sort of everybody's children, um, and they take care of each other as well. Um, it's a food has become a crisis, as I mentioned, and this is the uh, baobab fruit. So they're, it's a very dense hard fruit that they'll grind up and put with water to eat. And that's really what they're surviving on. So part of the work we're doing with Ruth is not only to come in and do some medical and health education programs. Um, this population has now been infected with HIV AIDS, um, as well as syphilis, TB, and other STDs. And it's a huge problem for them. So we fund uh, every three months Ruth to go out and test each camp. And she has to go find them in the past. So what we've done is provide a cell phone, one cell phone per camp, so they can tell her where they are. 
um, and food relief when she goes so they can have some protein. Um, and she takes care of them on site as she can and takes them to hospital when needed. Um, actually, one exciting thing about these Hadza is this fall we were able to digitize their health rec records. So now they all actually, it's like we can track them and keep track of their health. So this is a program that we've been working with for a number of years. We helped her launch Malegro and we'll continue to work with her as long as she's committed to this. There is no other NGO out there. It's, that's so shocking to me. I kept thinking, where's Save the Children or something? Like I thought, so you know, Compassion International, like where is the big guys? And they're just not there. Um, maybe because it's so difficult to communicate with them. It's so difficult to get out there. It's so far away. Um, so our last warrior that I'm gonna highlight tonight is Mr. Elias Shayo. Elias is a very good friend of ours. He's been working with us on Unite Tours. He's a safari guide. He used to run his own school. And he's also a very respected elder in his community, which is a very important part of the project because it's all about reputation and leadership and social hierarchy. Here we are with his family, his mother, his wife, his uh, daughter and granddaughter. So when we, Kim and I, my sister, who runs the program with me, sat down with Elias a couple of years ago, and at the time, you know, our funds tend to go from less, you know, not very much to even less. <laughs> and we said, you know, if we only have a few hundred dollars, what can we do to really make a difference? And he said, you girls must invest in the women. They are suffering. And many of them have the capability to do so much more. So we are here to empower the women. We created with Elias the St. Louis uh, Women's Loan Program. And through that program, we offer education, business education projects for women, as well as loans, microloans. Um, and it's a, choosing who is your borrower is the real key to success here. And because Elias is choosing women within his community and extended community who know that he's a respected leader, you know, failing to repay a loan is really not socially acceptable. So we have not had a fail rate at all, uh, but I believe that's because he picks women so carefully. Um, and he really vets them and their work. Um, here we are, I am with Alice, who's a friend who started uh, this store in Morogoro, Tanzania. Here's another friend who has a roadside stand, um, another organic farm. These are the types of projects that we invest in, sewing, a lot of sewing, especially for the younger girls who have dropped from school. They tend to be very good at this, and they create fashions that they can sell in their shops, things like baskets, uh, restaurants, and here is the, some women from the Ashe collection. We work with a woman with a program called Tanzania Maasai Women's Art to work with a Maasai women whose really one marketable skill is beading. They adorn themselves very beautifully. And we work with them and a European designer to create fashion that's saleable to a Western audience. And then Unite buys and sells this, this product to build a market in the US and to create an ongoing revenue stream for them. This is Esther, and she had never worked in her life. Uh, she was always someone's daughter or wife, and she never thought she could do anything, but she really wanted to do chickens. So we've been working with her, and now she has, uh, I think, about 500 chickens, and she's the biggest meat supplier in her village, and she feels so good. I mean, the way she stands, the way she talks, everything about her has shifted over the past couple of years. It's really exciting. Um, this is me with Regina. Regina's hilarious. Um, we love her story because she came to us for a loan to start a restaurant. And at a restaurant, she sells one thing, cow soup. This is all the parts of a cow that nobody wants to eat, which isn't much. It's the hoofs, the horns, you know, the skin. I mean, anything. And it goes in there and boils, and this is considered a great delicacy. So it costs about 50 cents a bowl, which is a pretty big deal. And she's done so well with her business that she's opened two more shops. She's hired many women to work for her, and her children are now paying students at the Heaven School. So it all has gone around. It's been wonderful. Um, Philomena is another friend that we met on the side. She was selling her wares on the side of the road in the dirt. So we gave her a loan to go in and get a stall inside the Maasai Market, which is a tourist destination. And she even has um, a sewing machine. She's creating her own fashion, so she's doing very, very well. So these are some of our success stories of women's empowerment. And lastly, not all these warriors are not always you know, having big projects. A warrior is also just anyone who's committed to uplifting his or her life and is passionate and willing to work hard. So we identify many, many, many children to whom we award school fees. And we'll find them uh, left at home or on the streets 
or also in government schools. This is what a typical government school looks like in Tanzania. It's literally a shell of a building, most of which were built during uh, the colonial days and have not really been touched ever since. Um, there's one teacher often for over 100 children, and the textbooks look like this. So this is a disaster. So we will only sponsor children to go to private English-speaking schools. And um, things like, this is the Sega School in Morogoro, where we send quite a few girls, and we also work closely with them on a business empowerment program. Uh, Sega takes girls who had dropped from school due to pregnancy. So they are picking up the girls that are getting expelled and putting them through a secondary education. So this is a very, very exciting program actually run by an American woman who worked with CARE for 10 years. She's fantastic. Uh, the Tumaini Junior School is in Karatu. This is run by a Tanzanian who actually studied under Mr. Elias Shayo. And the children there have a very safe uh, productive environment in which to learn and stay healthy. So these are the types of places that we're sending them. And I'm going to close just with another video from our documentary that's coming out in a couple of months. Um, this is Estrita Catalieva. She's one of the women that inspire us each and every day. She's been a friend since the beginning. Um, and we have lots of big plans together. But let me just see. Oopsie. Let me see if I can get this to go for us. This is a good one. Oops. Sorry, guys. Hold on. Stay with me. Sugar. This is the best clip we have. Hold on. Oh no. Oh no, no, no. Okay, well, let's just not worry about that. Maybe while I'm trying to get that sorted out, it's sort of thinking. If anyone has any questions, and we can close with that. Um, yeah. What are the common uh, diseases that they're fighting with malaria? Well, malaria is obviously a big problem. Um, malaria, HIV, AIDS, um, those are two sort of endemic TB. Um, Josephine, you may be able to answer that better than me. A lot of dysentery, waterborne illness. Yeah, just dysentery. Also, as long as they don't have um, clean water and very good food, there are a lot of children that have very bad lymph nodes in their neck. They don't get throat, they don't have throat problems, but they have ear problems and they have um, enormous uh, lymph glands in their neck, which is a big sign of them. Oh. Their diet and poor food. Okay. So that's, I mean, that's, that's not the big problem, malaria, but. There's a lot, a lot of sub problems that come from malnutrition, a lot, a lot of stunted growth, a lot of stunted growth, um, which of course stunts brain development. So this is the final clip I want to close with. I love this so much. Okay. I love kids. It's a passion. I just want to have people around me, young ones. If I happen to get somebody who is in need, I take him or her on. It has been like that for years. There's a time I had 14 people in the house. Yes, I had three girls and one boy from my school, Adranikoba, and some dependents from my husband's side, plus my six children, and I'm happy. Yeah. Now, you see, this is my ex-student. I know Piri. She has a she has a baby. We got her. She had already uh, she left school because she was, she had a baby in primary school. So we came to her. We took her in. It was a lot of counseling from motherhood, and she didn't know who to leave the baby with to come to school. We are helping her out. Your, your son is now in Elena. What is she? What is the baby? In which school? I'm from Area 5. Area 5? That's The baby is now in Standard 2 in the primary school. It's a, it's a big boy. That's, that's my passion. I enjoy it. I really I feel satisfied. I like to see them move from one stage to another. And then I say, yes, at least I helped one person to have a better life. the clothes. Isn't she wonderful? Mm -hmm. So does anyone have any other questions? Mm -hmm. Thanks guys.